What it do, YouTube? It's your boy, Man Man So Crazy TV. Hey, we got my boy Juicy Liz up here. We with another collab, man. We got the OG in this thing. Hey, kamikaze in this thing, baby. What it do, homie? What it is, cuz? What's happening with you? Hey, man. Hey, how you doing today, bro? Hey, man, I'm good. I'm blessed. It's another day above ground, man. So, you know, it's, it's a blessing. So, we here. Uh, good to see another day. Happy to be with y'all, man. You for know sure. what I'm saying? Let's, 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 let's see what we're going to talk about. Today, yeah, man. for sure, bro. Hey, it is an honor to be with the legend, man. Like, bro, since I was a little kid, boy, I used to hear you on the radio. Uh, a lot of the uh, other rappers around here, they can't say Mississippi, Jack Town without saying Kamikaze, man. I appreciate it, bro. Hey, for it. sure, for sure. So you most it. definitely is a Jew City legend, I appreciate man. it. I appreciate it. Appreciate man, it. Man, we're going to take it from the beginning, man. Uh, okay. What uh, what part of Jackson are you from? I'm from the north side, man. North uh, side. You know what I'm saying? The sun always shines in the north. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I grew up in uh, Northgate, man. Okay. Uh, right next to Valley North, yeah. right off of Watkins. Uh, that's where I came up, man, on the north side. So, you know, uh, mm -hmm. I went to Chastain. Okay. With Junior High. Yeah. Uh, you know what I'm saying? So all of my partners did, uh, stayed on the north side, the Valley North, Norwood. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, Ghost Town. I went, you know what I'm saying? All yeah. the way through that Ghost Town. I know, uh, I forget who that was. I was talking the other day, man. Uh, you know, Tony B. Yeah. Uh. Um, Dinger, the Ragged Bumpkins, yeah. uh, you know what I'm saying, all those cats stayed over that way, you know what I'm saying, over in the ghost town area, but that was still on the north side, so, you know, from my from my end all the way over there, man, wherever I could ride my bike to, that's where I was at, yeah. you know what I'm talking about, but yeah, Northgate is my neighborhood, man. Okay, man, uh, tell us, uh, bro, what uh, inspired you to uh, be a rapper from Jackson, man? Man, I mean, it's a crazy story, uh, you know, I came up with the name Kamikaze at Chastain, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Uh, you know, my mama was a school teacher. She taught her power. Uh, she was an English teacher. And, uh, you know, for her, every day, she made me open up the dictionary. I had to learn a new word every day in yeah. the dictionary. So when I was trying to come up with a rap name, everybody at that time had an MC this or an MC that yeah. to their name. So I wanted to come up with something that was a little bit different. I wanted to come up with something that sounded intimidating. So I went in the dictionary and I saw Kamikaze. And uh, I started using that in the seventh, eighth grade at Chastain, man. The kamikaze in Japanese means a divine wind. I know yeah. a lot of people, uh, you know, associate kamikaze with the, you know, the Japanese pilots. But in actuality, it means a divine wind in Japanese. So when I read and saw the definition, I was like, okay, you know, it yeah. sounds pretty hard right here. I'm going to use that. Uh, but, you know, usual thing, man. Uh you know, trying to get the girls, man. Yeah, uh, that was really that was really what it was. And so you know, uh, you know, starting out dancing because it really at first really the cats that was getting all the girls was the cats that was break dancing. Right. So, yeah. you know, I started out doing that. Uh, I started out, you know, what I'm saying, doing all the b boy battles, uh, trying to perfect my windmill, the whole little thing, man. Doing yeah. my thing at chest thing. That's kind of where we started doing it at. And, uh, you know, it was a whole bunch of cats out the city that came out of Chastain, man. You know what I'm saying? On the north side, it just started back, you know, in that generation. Yeah. Uh, so it just started out, you know, breakdancing. Yeah. And breakdancing turned into beatboxing, and the beatboxing turned into the rapping. So whatever was happening at the time that was going to get you some kind of attention, Yeah. that's what you really started doing. So, yeah. you know, I, I started writing poetry and doing a lot of writing, you know, early on when I was in elementary school and being in poetry contests and all that thing. You know, I always been into writing, so it was kind of easy for me to put those rhymes together. So yeah. you know, what I'm saying I started putting rhymes together and it started getting, you know, what I'm saying started getting tighter and tighter and tighter. You yeah. know, what I'm saying you know opening that dictionary up every day, you yeah. know, learning the new words. So you know, a dude's vocabulary was kind of thorough to yeah. be in the eighth and ninth grade. You yeah. know, what I'm talking yeah. about so sure. uh, you know, so I started writing rhymes and. It just started just snowballing from there, man. Really wasn't taking it seriously, you know. Still just doing it as a hobby. Still just doing it as something to get some attention. Didn't really get serious about it until after I graduated from Jackson State. Yeah. Well, like, coming up in your era, man, like, back then in Jackson, Jackson was known for, like, a lot of gangster raps. Like, mm -hmm. how did you fit in with the Mississippi Mafias and and the, and the other people that would come up, the Buddha Boss players and stuff? Well, I'm going to tell you really, man, like, you know, and I heard the interview that you had with uh with, with Slick and Pimp shit. Uh, you know, I heard the interview that you had with Melo T. Like, in our generation, 
you know, even though people like to say it was, it really wasn't as much separation as people really say it was. Because yeah. at the time, it wasn't enough of us to be separate. You right. know what I'm saying? We were all pretty much in one one pot. So, you know, when those shows was going down at Inez's and those shows was going down at the UG and when Donnie Money was throwing those shows, for the most part, if you rapped and you were serious about it, you had to be there. Yeah. So it wasn't one of those things where these cats was rapping over here and these cats was rapping over there. Like at that time, it wasn't enough people to, to have two or three different shows around town. So everybody that was rapping, you had to rap in front of everybody. Regardless of what your style was, you had to get in front of that crowd and you had to win them over. And uh, that was the challenge. And that's why I say in that generation, that's why, you know, we were always, in my opinion, more talented and more prepared than a lot of people that came from other places because, you know, you had to cut your teeth, man, in front of those crowds, man. A lot of them was gangster crowds. Sometimes they was college crowds. It just yeah. depended, you know what I'm saying? Because we did our things over at the Chateau, which was the building right across from Tuvalu. Uh, we did our thing over there. And even when we did our shows, Mississippi Mafia and Valley of the Dry Bones and DSP and uh, Renegades, all them folks would come over to our shows and, and be at those shows as well, Wildlife Society. So whether it was Inez's or the UG, uh, or whether it was the Chateau across from Tuvalu, regardless of where, or the Elks on Lynch Street, regardless of where it yeah. was, you had to get in front of that crowd and you had to show and prove. If you were good, the crowd showed you love. If you wasn't good, they wasn't going to show you love. So it didn't matter if you was rapping gangster shit or if you had more of a hip-hop thing than what yeah. you were doing. You had to be good, period, to get on stage. Yeah. And uh, that's, what, that's what I think separated us from a lot of people because, you know, it wasn't wasn't separation. You had to you had to be good. Yeah. Like I gotta stress that like you couldn't be slow. You had right. to be good. So <laughs> even if you was doing, you know, what people considered to be hip hop at the time, which, you know what I'm saying, our crew was considered to be doing, you had to have a really good stage show and you had to be performing, man, and you had to do something that was gonna impress the crowd. And if you mm -hmm. did that, you got their respect. So you started off in the group? Uh Oh, so. I started off and started off in the group. Yeah. The group. So yeah, I started off in the group. So I started off in a group called the Network, which was me, my brother, and a dude by the name of MC J C. We met, you know, me and J C met at Jackson State. Uh I DJ, DJ Maestro, uh stayed across the hall from me in Dixon Hall. So, you know, we got together and then, you know, after we formed the network, of course, we were a part of our crew called the Stew Pot Storeways. And the Stew Pot mm. Storeways was, you know, the network, uh David Banner, who was MC Vale at the time, uh, Abstract Mind State, which was Mad Skills at the time, uh, Ragged Bumpkins, of course, uh, was there as well. Uh, we had cats from the Midwest, we had cats from Nigeria, we had a big mm. crew. So we was kind of like the Wu-Tang of, of Jackson, yeah. really, pretty much at the time. So, uh, you know, I started out in that group, and then we were part of that bigger crew called uh, the Stew Pie Storeways, and that was before actually me and Banner actually got together and formed Crooked Letters, but we formed Crooked Letters from being a part of the Stew Pie Storeways together. So anybody that was at Jackson State around that time or anybody that was doing shows around that time uh, will remember the crew. Uh, you know, even, you know, we was talking to Mississippi Mafia and, 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 uh, and, uh, and Mello. Yeah. Uh, you know, we were all doing shows together. Mm -hmm. So it was Stew Pie Storeways, and then it was a 601 click. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, you know, that was our little hip-hop crew. And then, you know, the 601 click uh, was the cast that was doing a lot of the harder music. Uh, but we was all doing shows and getting together and collaborating on shows. So it was always a friendly and a healthy competition. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it was always love. Because, like I said, at the time, we started doing music when that shit wasn't popular. Right. Like, now, you can go outside and chunk a rock down the street and you're going to hit somebody rapping. Mm -hmm. but, you know what I'm saying? At that time... It was still still seen as a fad. So, you know, at the time, you could really count on two hands how many people were really serious about rapping. Uh, people really didn't think it was going to last. I tell people all the time, it's kind of funny because a lot of cats that were selling dope around that time, man, a lot of niggas that was in the streets, you know, they didn't see what we were doing as something that was going to be sustainable. You know, they mm -hmm. thought that was just some shit that we was doing because we was watching TV. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, you look up six, seven, eight years later and them same niggas and turned around and they started rapping. Mm -hmm. So, you know, once they found out that it was here to stay, niggas jumped on the bandwagon. But we was doing that shit when it wasn't super popular in the city of Jackson and everybody wasn't doing it. So, you know, shouts out to everybody that started around in that generation, man. But like I said, you had to be thorough yeah. if you wanted to be a part of it at that time. It was my... Yeah. Hey, um, 
When you say mad skills, are you talking about the same mad skills uh, from Virginia? The one no, nah, mad skills is the name of this group. Uh, Ice Greed, EP, and uh, Rest in Peace, Pedo. Uh, they were mad skills. Okay. And then they evolved and turned into Abstract Mind State. Uh, you can go check them out. By the way, they were the, one of the first acts signed to uh, Kanye West label, to Yeezy, mm. to Yeezy Sound. Uh, they got an album out right now, so make sure you go check out Abstract Mind State, uh, Ice Green, and EP. But uh, yeah, they came from uh, Jackson State, man. You know okay. what I'm saying? That's where they came from. So we got a lot of cats, man, that came out of our crew, man. Besides Crooked Letters, Abstract Mind State, guy with uh, Kanye West. Uh, we got uh, Chico, vice versa, who ended up uh, signing with Slum Village, going mm. on the road with okay. Slum Village. We got DJ Scrap, who eventually founded uh, Violator All Star DJs with Chris Lighty. Uh, of course, we got DJ Fingerprint. Awesome. Like, you know, our crew was real thorough. You know yeah. what I'm saying? We got we got cats that, you know, went on to do a lot of great things in the industry. Like I said, all that started <clears throat> at Jackson State University. All that started on the yard. All that started with the stew pot stowaways. Yeah. And that shit just morphed into, you know, everybody going in their particular directions of doing their thing from Crooked Letters over here to Abstract Mind State to DJ Scrap to vice versa to, you know, Rack of Bumpkins to, you know, the whole crew. Yeah. What, what, uh, at what point did you meet David Banner. I met Banner in the crew. Um, I remember when when we actually brought Banner into <clears throat> the Stu Pot Stowaways. Uh, it was an AMG show. It was AMG, Set It Sail, Sebo. Like mm-hmm. at the time, like a lot of people don't know, like we was fucking with with the Bay Area artists, real real tough, right. in yeah. Jackson. Yeah. Uh, AMG had that bitch better have my money, you mm-hmm. know, DJ Quick, Set It Sail, High C, mm-hmm. all them cats, we was fucking with all them real tough, so they was coming here doing shows like it wasn't nothing. Uh, E-40 and the Click, all of them right. was coming through here doing shows, so we were at the uh, National Guard Armory right by the fairgrounds, the fairgrounds Armory was a show there, AMG was at this show, and uh, you know, we were backstage at this show, we was freestyling, because everybody knew us as the crew, that was always freestyle. It didn't matter where it was at. If we was on the yard, if we was backstage at the show, if we was at somebody's crib, if we was at a club, we was going to be in a circle and we was going to be freestyling. So uh, we started freestyling, man, and this dude just walked up, real gruff, walked up, jumped in the cypher, man, and started rapping and just blew everybody away. And that was MC Vale at the time. Yeah, so we right. was like, damn, who was this nigga? And, uh, you know, he was like, I'm MC Vail, I'm doing this, yada, yada, yada. And his DJ at the time was uh, Mario, who had Sound to Sound, mm-hmm. uh, right. the, the record store that everybody was always putting their records in on consignment. So uh, we was like, dude, you need to fuck with us. So, you know, instantly he became a part of the Stu Pot Storeways, he became part of the crew. So, you know, we was all producing records with each other. He was producing records for everybody in the crew. We was rapping on each other's songs. Like, we really had a Wu-Tang vibe to this whole thing. We just didn't understand at the time how to take it and cultivate it and turn it into something else. But, you know, that's how I ended up meeting him. And uh, <clears throat> at one point, me and him would always be going heads up with each other to see who was gonna have the hottest verses on the song. So every time we did a crew song, me and him would go back and forth with who was gonna write the tightest verse. So me and him had our own little internal, you yeah. know, competition going between yeah. us because we was a cast that was, you know what I'm saying? We was coming with the verses a lot. Not, you know, the whole crew was coming with it, but me and him just had our little thing going back and forth. So, you know, he came to me one day and he was like, look, you dope, I'm dope. We going back and forth. I think we'll be better if we pull our talents together and we form a group. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know what I'm saying? I think, you know, we'll be, you know, I think we can make moves a little bit faster if we do that. And he was like, I got the name, got the idea for us. So he was like, we're going to call ourselves Crooked Letters. Yeah. And he was like, because if we call, you call us Crooked Letters, anybody that says that name anywhere, they're going to be saying Mississippi. Right. So regardless of where they're at, when they say Crooked Letters, they're going to be saying Mississippi and they're going to be paying homage to Mississippi. So that's what we're going to call ourselves. And that's, you know, that's how that basically started. We came together. Uh, formed a group Crooked Letters. Uh, we put our first demo together in uh, the winter of 95. I remember the first studio session we had. We went to Freddie Young Studio uh, Freddie on Capitol. And it was an ice storm. Mm-hmm. I remember this vividly. It was an ice storm. The city was shut down. Uh, and I was on the campus. And he was still in the Queens at the time. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, I remember us piling into his green Kia. We got in his Kia 
and we drove like 10 miles an hour to the studio. You know, Freddie Young's studio was at his crib. So right. he was like, shit, y'all can come or not. It don't matter because I'm at the house. So if y'all don't come, it's cool. And if y'all do come, I walk outside and I come. So this was our very first time going in the studio and putting a session together, man. So we got in his Kia. We drove like 10 miles an hour across the ice. He came <laughs> and got me off the yard. I walked down a little bit from the yard. So he wanted to come up, have to come up on the yard. Yeah. Got in his car. We drove 10 miles an hour to Freddie Young's studio, which was up the street on Capitol. It was up the street from Jackson State, so it wasn't far. We didn't have that far to go, and he came from the Queens. So, actually, we recorded that demo in December of 95. And uh, by 96, June of 96, we was in Unsigned Hype in the Source. And then when we got Unsigned Hype in the Source, you know, shit just kind of took off from there. And shout out to Ragabunk, by the way. Ragabunk was actually the first group from Mississippi to be at Unsigned Hype at the Source. Oh, uh, okay. At the source. Oh. So they were actually the first to do that. We were the second. Yeah. Uh, so shouts out to uh, Humdinga, rest in peace, Fat Daddy. Uh, they was the first ones to get that look. And then we came right behind them in June of 96 yeah. and got an Unsigned Hype. And then, uh, you know, at the time when that meant something. Uh, so basically, if you got an Unsigned Hype at the Source at the time, you was for sure mm-hmm. gonna get a deal right, mm-hmm. uh, at some point. So, you know, of course, that's what happened. You know what I'm saying? So we were in Unsigned Hype, and then uh, shortly after we got an Unsigned Hype in the source, about a year or so later, a year and a half or so later, we ended up signing a mm-hmm. major deal. Uh, back then, like, um, you and Banner coming up, bro. First of all, bro, that was a, a damn, damn good move, Banner. Poor the poor, you and him together, bro, because, mm-hmm. uh, you one of the most lyrical dudes that uh that's coming out of Mississippi, bro. You know what I'm saying? And then I'm proud to say you from Jackson. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, bro, David Banner, he was a producer. Was he making beats then, too? Yeah, he was making beats. I was actually, it's funny because I was making beats, too, at the time. So me and him were doing production for a lot of the cats in our crew. Uh... But that nigga was just way better, dog. You know what I'm saying? So, he had to make it away. Uh, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, and at the time, you know, he was he was doing his thing and he 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 had, he had the new ASR ten, you know, all the new shit that came out. Yeah. He ended up getting his hands on it. So at the time, if you had that ASR ten, uh he was really working with some shit. So we moved our way up, man, because you know, a lot of motherfuckers don't know when we was recording in Freddie Young's studio, we was recording on uh Big ass A dats, right? Yeah, that looked like VCR tape. Yeah, yeah, those, yeah. Uh, we recorded on the reels, on the one inch reels. You yeah, had to go to Sound and Communications on State Street. Salute the bitch, yeah, man. Yeah, you had to go to Sound and Communications <laughs> on State Street, man, to get all your shit. Yeah, whether it was your reel to record at Freddy's, whether it was your A dat, whether it was your dat, uh, whether it was your CDs. CD cases, covers, all that shit. You had to go to Sound and Communications on State Street. If you wasn't going there, you was fucked off. But yeah. that's where everybody was at. So they was getting all the music money at the time. They had everything. Yeah. Like, you know, and he knew everybody by name. Because if you came in there regularly, the white dude with the glasses. I don't remember his name, <laughs> but I know who he was. You know what I'm saying? I remember going in there when they was getting ready to move and shut down mm-hmm. after things, after technology just yeah. put niggas out the game. Yeah, but right, um, right. at the time, that's where you had to go. You had to go to get your cassette. So we went from the reels. The one inch reel, we went to that to the A dat, and then we went from that to the dat. And then yeah. we went from that to it being digital after a little while. So we yeah. went from doing that and we went from making beats on the cassettes and transferring them on Freddie. You know, shouts out to Freddie Young, because Freddie Young put yeah. everybody in the yeah. game. That's one of the true OGs and icons in the for game. Sure. If it wasn't yeah. for Freddie Young, it's a lot of niggas around here who wouldn't be doing what they was doing. Uh, he he, he recorded everybody yeah. as a matter of fact so um yeah so you, you know we we went over there and did our thing but you know he was just way dope but he had the asi 10 um he had the beat machine he had the full track he had all the shit so it was at a point where i was like you know what nigga you go ahead and you do that shit because yeah. right now you killing everybody so he was so far advanced with making beats i was like shit nigga i'm gonna give you these rhymes and you make these beats so you know banner was like the personality yeah and the, and the character no, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the energy and I was the lyrics. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I was going, you know, regardless of what it was, I was going to bring the lyrics. I was going to bring the spit. That was my job. So that's how that worked really well. And then, of course, Fingerprint came in 
and provided, you know what I'm saying, the yeah, scratches and all good. the cuts that need to be on that, man. Yeah. So, you know, all of that shit worked yeah. well. All that shit yeah, fit together because we was two different styles, man. So all of that shit fit together. And, uh, you know, that's how we ended up in the source yeah. and that's how the deal came about. And, you know, shit just kind of took off now, bro. Yeah. I, back then, I heard that uh, the local radio station... They weren't just too much playing. No, nah, they were Local weren't. park. Uh, Paul Todd actually said to, you know, to me and to a lot of people, Paul Todd, who was the program director at the time before Stan Branson, he said, JMI will never play rap. Mm -hmm. He said, we will never, ever play rap music. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, of course, he was wrong. He couldn't have been more wrong than anything in the world. I think shortly after that, you know, they were forced to, to do it. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's Jackson, it's Mississippi. You had yeah. a lot of older people who were running the radio stations and running the clubs at the time, and they didn't understand the juggernaut that hip-hop was right. going to be. Right. So, you know, uh, yeah. everybody ran into that opposition. It didn't matter what area it was. You know, right. niggas that was doing disco in the 70s, mm -hmm. you know, black <laughs> folks that was doing music in the Fact. 50s and 60s, everybody was going to run into somebody right. who was like, that shit ain't gonna be shit, it ain't gonna do shit, it ain't right. gonna move, whatever. And, uh, you know, all you had to do was just wait. And the next thing you know, um, Cat started getting played on the radio. So, Wildlife Society was probably the first group that I heard get played. It was after they got their deal. Shouts out to, to Metal on them. They were actually the first act to get a major deal from yeah. Mississippi. Now, you know, Mississippi Mafia was doing their thing. I think they was with Sir Cap, and they right. was doing Selecto hits at the time. So, you know, they kind of preceded all of that. But the first cats to get a major deal wildlife. was Wildlife Society. Salute. So, you know, shouts out to them. So about a year before we ended up getting our deal, they had their deal. Mm -hmm. And they were the first people you could hear Jack Town or What's Up Jack yeah. on, on the radio. Right. Yeah, you know, Stan started showing love. And then, of course, after that, you know, they had Firewater and Get Crummy. We was actually the first group that had two songs in rotation at the same time on Jamma. You know, Stan, we usually let you come through, play a song, let it die out, then bring me another record, and I'll put it on. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, we had Firewater at the time, and then Get Crunk with Pimp C got so hot that he had to put it in rotation too. So we mm -hmm. actually had two songs in rotation on JMI at the same time. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Going back to back. Sometimes you hear him back to back on the radio and it just it had just never happened before. So it actually, you know, opened the floodgates uh for a lot of cats here that started getting played on the radio. And shouts out to DJ Scrap because DJ yeah. Scrap was at JMI at the time. Yeah. So he kinda knew what was happening. So he was also instrumental and helping to make sure that Wildlife Society, Crooked Letters, and all the cats that got on the radio at the time, he was instrumental in, uh, in helping to make that happen too. Just by telling the stand, like, hey, this is yeah. what these cats are doing. And then, yeah. you know, when you got the magazines and, you know, at the time it wasn't blogs, it wasn't in the internet, any of that stuff. At that time, it was big shit for you to get in these magazines and in these publications. So that was the that was the going viral back in the day. Right, you know what right. I'm saying? So when you were in the Source magazine and Vibe magazine, Beat Down, Murder Dog, when you was in all those magazines, you had something tangible that you could go in and show people. So he was just letting Stan know what was happening. And, uh, you know, the records just started getting played from there. And then that's, you know, that's when we started hitting the road, man, and traveling the whole country, man, doing our thing. I don't mean stopping them, but... Bro, you just mentioned Pimp C. Mm -hmm. How did y'all get Pimp C to get on y'all song? We just reached out to him. Uh, we, we went to Atlanta recording some of the Gray Skies album. We actually listened, we actually listened to Riding Dirty mm -hmm. in the green Kia. You know what I'm saying? Banner had this green Kia. Didn't have no radio in it. It got stolen. So we had a CD player. And we actually rode six hours listening to Riding Dirty back to back to back, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Shouts out to Smoke D, because we was really listening and supporting because Smoke D yeah. was our boy. Uh, but we listened to Ryan Dirty, so we got over there, and we was like, man, we got to get Pimp C on this record, man. Uh, we got to do a song with Pimp C, because for us, Pimp C was the pinnacle. Right, right. And uh, we was like, man, we got to do it. So we basically reached out. Some people at the label reached out. We was in Atlanta, and Pimp C was living in Atlanta at the time, mm -hmm. and Pimp C was like, hey, come over to my crib. So to this day, man, like when I tell people, you know, I can say I'm one of the few people that got a chance to do a song with Pimp C. I'm one of the few people that got a chance to go to Pimp C's crib. Yeah. He produced a record in his crib, pre-produced a record in his crib. Uh, 
played all the shit on the on the on the song, came up with the whole melody for the song. He was like, This is what y'all niggas need to do right here. He was like, Y'all remember yeah. that run DMC rock box? Sure. And he was, you know, a lot of people don't know, Pimp C really looked up to run DMC. Pimp C mm. wanted to be DJ Ron. Uh, mm. you know, Ron, Ron DMC. Um that, sense, that was that was that was one of his biggest influences. Yeah. So he was like, Man, y'all remember Rockbox, uh, Ron DMC and Ron, Ron DMC is one of my favorite groups. And uh he started playing the melody to the song. He was like, Boom, let's do it. Mm. And Pimp I C remember making the beat too? Yeah, Pimp C made the beat. Damn. He was making we went to his crib, we went yeah. to his house. Yeah. We was in his house, in his living room, he had his keyboard out and we Pre-made the beat in there, and uh, at the time, Tila had a song out that was kind of using that rock box melody. Mm. So it's a funny story because we was like, uh, you know, he was like, "Y'all need to use this right here." I'm telling you, this gonna jam, and we was like, uh, "Well, Tila got a record out that sound kind of like that right now, man. Tila got a record kind of sound like that." He was like, "Man, fuck that shit." Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> y'all need to do this shit here, man. Oh, so yeah, man. basically, he. He uh, impressed upon us that we needed to do it, and he was right. So he came up with the record. We did the shit at his crib. We pre-produced it at his crib that night. The next night, we went to Doppler Studios in Atlanta and laid the song down. He came in, laid the song down. Uh, also, fantastic story. Who was in there that night? Too Short came into the studio session. Hard. And that uh, we was there that night. So we in our studio session, two niggas from Mississippi doing a song with Pimp C., too Short come through the studio session and fuck with us. And Too Short was fucking with Mississippi real tough mm -hmm. because he was fucking with Sir Cap real right, tough. Right. So, you know, he, you know, knew of Mississippi niggas and he was like coming through and we met, talked, chopped it up, man, smoked, did all that good shit, man, knocked the song out, knocked my verse out last. Pimp told me that I was dope. Uh, and I can go to my grave right now being one of the few people that Pimp told personally that he was dope. So, oh, you know, bro. uh, at that time, shit, it don't get no better than that. Yeah, at the man, time for a legend to tell you that you dope. So, yeah. you know, and I ended the song off. And oh, Pepsi yeah. always said, you know, shit, uh, you know, either you beginning that bitch or you ending that bitch. You know what I'm saying? You got to come hard. Yeah, and, uh, but, you know, because for us paying homage to him, we was like, man, you got to start off the song. And right. he started it off. And everybody know how that verse go on the song, sure, man, yeah. and it made it, and it just made it a classic from there, man. And yeah. you know, after that, you know, he promoted the song, he pushed it. Anytime people was putting, you know, UGK songs on mixtapes, they mm -hmm. put Get Crunk on there, even if they thought that that was his song, it didn't matter. But you know, what I'm saying that song started matriculating, and shit, man, we was doing shows all across the southeast. From you know, I was, you know, we was talking about Houston before we started, yeah. you know, recording, but from Houston and Port Arthur through Baton Rouge, all the way through Lafayette, Alexandria, all the way through Jackson, going all the way over to Atlanta. That's Get Crunk cool. was on file with us. So we was doing shows all through that, just based off of that. Niggas didn't even know what we looked like. Uh, oh. You know, because our picture was on the inside of the CD and on the back, but you know, we wasn't on the cover. We didn't have no video. We didn't have any of that shit. Oh. You know what I'm saying? Label didn't do any of that shit. Like we did all that shit on our own by, you know, producing that record and having that record to float like it did, right. it started making moves. So a lot of times we showed up to these shows, man, like niggas could have really literally went and and, and been imposters. Yeah. Niggas could have literally went and did shows because niggas didn't know what yeah. the fuck we looked like. You know what I'm saying? Right. They had to really had a CD or do the research uh, to see who we was, but our song was jamming everywhere. Shouts out to Dobie D, uh, you know, UGK's DJ. He was yeah. on the radio in Lafayette, so we used to do a whole bunch of shows all through Louisiana. Lafayette, Alexandria, Baton Rouge, New Orleans. Uh, shouts out to Wild Wayne in New Orleans, man. Super we was doing shows Wayne. all all through that, man. Just yeah, based yeah. off of Get Crunk alone, you yeah. know what I'm saying? The Noriega Cut, Firewater had us all along the East Coast, Damn, so, in the Midwest, oh. and Get Crunk had us all along in the South, man, so you know, it was a blessing, you know what I'm saying, that we stayed moving with those records, man, uh, you know, for a year straight. But did you know when y'all cut Get Crunk that y'all was gonna be part of a new uh, era in, in music with the crunk uh, scene? Didn't, man, because it's crazy because they put that record on this compilation called Get Crunk that Tommy Boy put out, the label we was on. So we was on that record, that uh, compilation, Lil John, Lyrical Giants, you know, all the crunk records at the time, they put us on there because our song was called Get Crunk. They right. put it on there uh, and it just got added to the genre. Uh, yeah. And then when people started actually seeing our live shows, 
that's when our name started kind of flowing. Yeah. So we used to go on the road. Like, it's crazy because we used to go on the road with Lil John. We was on the road with Lil John and Lyrical Giants all the time, man. We was all through Georgia doing shows with these cats. And this is when Lil John was first getting started. And he had them first little records that had just started popping. And, you know, he yeah. was an A&R at So So Deaf. And he just started doing the Lil John and the East Side Boys records. Yeah. The Who You With records. Yeah. All Who those before the big shit. Yeah. So... We was doing all that shit, man, going through Georgia, doing all those records, man. And we did a show in Midtown in Atlanta one time. And uh, Lil John pulls to the side. He was like, hey, man, y'all got a, an amazing stage show. So when motherfuckers hear y'all's record, you know what I'm saying, they got to be able to make the cor correlation between the two. So we got, a, we got our name from our live show. Yeah. Uh, we didn't have a video again, a label. Didn't shoot when a video. Uh, so we made our name on our live show. And once people saw our live show and our hard, because we used to practice that show, man, you know, in Vanna's driveway over in the Queens on yeah. Maddox Ave, you know what right. I'm saying? Benz and, and, and Twice Savvy, all the folks that was on that street right there used to come up and watch us rehearse yeah. in that driveway on the Queens. And that's why I tell motherfuckers it's not like man. rehearsing is a huge part of this shit. Like right. you don't just get up on stage and do it if you're really serious about right. it. So, you know, we rehearsed those shows down all the way down to the T, all the way down to the cuts, all the way down to how all that shit was finna roll. We rehearsed that shit. So when we got on stage, that shit was crisp. And to this day, it ain't too many motherfuckers that's ever put on a better stage show no. than, than Crooked no. Lines. You no. know what I'm saying? And sure. even individually, when it go to Banner individually, if it goes to me individually, yeah. ain't nobody put on a better stage mm -hmm. show than either one of us individually because, you know, that's where we started from, being together and doing those shows together, man. Like, the live show probably was one of the most important elements. You can have a live-ass show and your music just be mid. You can have a live-ass show and right. motherfuckers will fuck with you. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. It'll take right. what you're doing to right. another level. You know what I'm saying? That's the most important thing. Cats mm -hmm. now... You know, just getting up on stage and saying, you know, DJ play number six, and they go up there and just rap over that bitch, and they think that's all they supposed to do, and that ain't what you get, folks, man. When the folks pay to come see you, right. and give them a show, not a karaoke show. Right. You got to give them a goddamn show. You know what I'm talking about? I want to ask you a question, mm -hmm. bro. Um, you say back then a lot of big major cats was coming to Jackson. Mm -hmm. Jackson seemed like it was like a major hub for them artists to come and get noticed. Like, Jackson was a spot that you had to stop in. Mm -hmm. What was it that people from Jackson couldn't get the big deals like the other people on the outside surrounding? Well, I say all the time, man, our talent has never been our problem. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? People will always fuck with us. If you go back to Donnie Money, like, Donnie Money is responsible, and, and DJ Finesse, Chris mm -hmm. Carr, they're responsible for a whole bunch of these niggas coming through Jackson. Yeah. Uh, Stokes spent a whole Some lot of money Stokes. with these cats, man. You know, Donnie Money was getting, you know, rap a lot to come to the UG way back in the day before we got jammed up. Stokes too. Chris Carr had every imaginable group come through Tiffany's that you can imagine. Uh, I remember when he had this spot called The Industry that was on Northview. Uh, mm -hmm. I saw the whole Cash Money click there and the whole No Limit click. That was when No Limit was first starting and shit, Sonya C., uh, P. Wife was rapping with them. This was mm. this was when they had all the new motherfuckers, <laughs> and they were going out as a clique. And this was when the Clad Cash Money clique had UNLV. Uh, That's hard. They had UNLV, and they had a bunch of the the new motherfuckers before they yeah. morphed into what they morphed into. But they was going and doing shows all together, yeah, right. as a clique. And you know, DJ Finesse was one of the first people to bring all the motherfuckers down here and do that shit, man. So you know, from the Ghetto Boys and all the rap a lot niggas with Dunny Money and Stokes bringing them through here between Finesse, like we had a pipeline of niggas that was coming through here, you know, fucking with us because cats was spending money with them. Uh, so you know, our problem was never relationships. Our problem was never talent. Our problem was just having you know the business knowledge and the business mm -hmm. acumen to be able to make it and know how to actually navigate in the music business. Because right. it's one thing to do music and it's one thing to think you dope, but it's another thing altogether in figuring out how to get your music to the people that it needs to get to. Yeah. Uh, and you know, like I said, when the 601 click and a lot of those people back in the day, man, you know, Cassidy, you know, 601 click was making mixtapes before Screw 
was making mixtapes. Mm. So the 601 Click was putting regular mixtapes together every month, just like DJ Screw was before. I heard a DJ Screw doing the same shit over there. Yeah. Niggas just didn't understand the concept of what they right. was doing and how to take it and go and elevate it to another level. So when you hear about DJ Screw, you know, going all the way to the point of getting the the the, the record store and the screw shot where you come in and pick the tapes up, you know, we was doing that shit over here yeah. years beforehand. Yeah. So all the shit that you saw other people do, man, you know, I tell people Mississippi is the birthplace of America's music. So Thanks. everything that you that you hear in the rest of this country had its origins in Mississippi someplace, mm -hmm. whether it's country music, whether it's blues, whether it's rock music. Uh, you know, all of that shit started here and kind of just branched out, you know, in the 60s and the 70s and then kind of blossomed in other places. Uh, but, you know, our problem has just been business acumen. It's not talent uh, because right. I've been all over the world and it's I have not been to a city or a state where niggas is better than we are right. at all, period. Thanks. And I'm not saying it because I'm from here uh -huh. and I'm not saying it because I got love for the city like that. I'm saying it because I've seen thousands of shows and I've seen thousands of niggas rapping and I've seen thousands of niggas and heard their albums on their independent levels and their local levels, whether it is Atlanta, whether it is Birmingham, whether it's New Orleans, Houston, Chicago, wherever. And there's not a set of niggas on the planet that's as good as Mississippi mm -hmm. niggas. Uh, you know what I'm saying? And that's just how we was bred. But we just didn't understand the business as much as other people did. And we didn't understand how to move as much as other people did. And we are now getting to the point where we're getting that together. But, you know what I'm saying, at that time, we just didn't know how to take what we were doing and monetize it mm. and create something with it. We just didn't that figure that sense. out yet. You know what I'm saying? So the talent was always there. But now, niggas is figuring out how to monetize. Niggas is figuring out how to hustle. Niggas is figuring out how to maneuver. Uh, and it's gotten better over time. But at that time, that's just basically what it was. You know, it was even for us. You know what I'm saying? Signing to a New York, signing to a New York label, uh, signing to Tommy Boy and Warner Brothers. You know, being from the South before signing Cats from the South became a thing. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Uh, before the South became huge. You know what I'm saying? They just didn't know what to do with us at the time. Yeah. But we also didn't have the business knowledge to figure out how to take our shit and maneuver it and do what we needed to do ourselves. You know what I'm saying? We ended up getting robbed by a manager. A manager, you know what yeah. I'm saying, took about shit six figures from us. Uh, almost fucked us up with the label. Uh, in fact, jammed us up with the label so bad that, you know, even after we tried to get off the label, that's one of the reasons why we couldn't even record as Crooked Letters for years. Right. Because we was in a fight to, you know, get that name. So, you know, we had to revert right. back to David Banner and Kamikaze and kind of do our own things to survive. Oh. And then that's what happened with him getting his deal and then me starting my label and, you know, me awesome. doing a Two Broke the Bar album and him doing his thing because, yeah. you know, we was in a legal fight. You know, we couldn't record his Crooked Letters because the label had all the rights to that. So we had to fight for years yeah. to that get that nice. back. And all of that shit started from us getting fucked over by this manager, which is one of the reasons why I went into management. One of the reasons why he took so long to get managers is because, you know, we don't want that shit to happen to us, to happen to anybody else in the game. So, you know, I wanted to put myself on that wall so I could be a stopgap for that shit happening to anybody around here, at least for the motherfuckers that I fuck with. Yeah. I wanted to make sure that it yeah. never happened to them. So, you know, it was a, a lesson learned uh, in being a part of the business, but, you know, that's what caused the separation and that's what, you know what I'm saying, Banner ended up getting his deal with Universal. I ended up doing a Two Broke the Ball album, you know, Bushy Edge of the White Me, same old clothes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, things just continue to just grow from that, man. It's all part of the evolution, you know. So, man, when you talk about your album, Two Broke the Ball, man, uh, we got to get into some of them bankers, man. Uh, one of my favorites on there, man. The song, uh, I Apologize. Mm -hmm. Can you speak uh, on that, man? So, Banner produced that record. Um, and that record, if people don't know, that record was actually on my first album, okay. AKA Mr. Show Enough, uh, okay. Firewater Boy number two. So that was actually on my first album. And I wanted to come up with something that sounded different than what Banner had put out yeah. at the time. You know, Banner had already, you know, did like a pimp, he had already right. did the other shit. So I wanted to do some shit, man, that was different and what he was doing. Yeah. So I was like, man, let me do this shit. And you know, I always wrote from a from personal experience. 
Okay. All those verses on those songs are personal experiences. So I wrote from a personal experience. Banner came up with the beat. And uh, we had a record on the Great Skies album <clears throat> that didn't come out. It's an unreleased track. Um, and then actually on the last song on the Great Skies album, Banner actually has a line that says, I apologize, I realize my ways ain't right. 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 So if you, you listen back to the Crooked Letters record on... Uh, the last song I know on the uh, Grey Skies album, he says that line. So he was just fucking around. He was coming up with the track and shit. And, uh, you know, I was saying the shit in my head. He was saying the shit. He was like, damn, you should use this. And I ended up using it and putting it on there for the hook, man. And I didn't have any idea that it was going to catch on like it did. I didn't have any idea. Uh, and at the time, you know, he was putting your records in the store on assignments, you know, we still had Camelot, we still had Sam Goody, still right. had Bebop. So I was going in, man, and Bebop always, and uh, Sam Goody, uh, Music Land, Sam Goody, mm -hmm. and the Metro Center always gave us a nice little display whenever mm -hmm. we did our, our shit. Yeah. <clears throat> we was one of the few motherfuckers here locally so, that Bebop. got, you know, them stands, they put the little stands mm -hmm. out in the front, we have a banner yeah. in the front, they have a spot for our CD, so they yeah. always show love. And, uh, you know, the dude from the store called me one day. He was like, man, I don't know what the fuck you did, man. It was a white dude. He was like, these records is flying off the shelves. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, um, Stan put the record on, on, on JMI, and the shit just took off. Like, I didn't realize it was going to do it because it wasn't a crunk record. It wasn't even really what niggas was doing, but I wanted to do something that niggas wasn't doing. Right. So relatable. I put, you know what I'm saying, it was relatable. Uh -huh. And, you know, when I'm running around here, the hardest niggas that you can goddamn see in the city, man, was running up to me talking about, man, dude, that shit jammed. That shit jammed. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it was, you know, and that just speaks to, you know, how organic shit works because, you know what I'm saying, when it was from the heart and people kind of felt it and gravitated to it and it worked. And it was actually the song that helped to sell that CD. And uh, I ended up putting it on Two Broke the Ball and it was a new crop of motherfuckers right. that heard the song that hadn't heard it before on the first album that was getting the record because they was getting it because of You Ain't Hard or Same Old Clothes. And they was like, damn, this shit on here jamming too. So uh, I, that was my idea to put it on that second record because I was like, we need to run this shit back because it was still running. Mm -hmm. Like I was doing shows all over the state of Mississippi on a motherfucking slow ass motherfucking <laughs> Vibe record, basically, right. you know what I'm saying? Hard, like, right. you know, so I was going in the hardest motherfucking clubs and the hardest spots, you know, doing these shows and these niggas in here talking about I want to hear, I apologize. So right. I was like, shit, nigga, that's what I want to hear. That's what we're going to do. You know what I'm saying? So I was like, we need to put this shit on the next record, put that shit on the next record. So the next record got a lot more traction because the songs got, you know what I'm saying? Those other songs got me in a lot of other different states and a lot of different places. So I had a chance for other people you know, uh, You Ain't Hard was like the number one record in Macon, Georgia, and Columbus, Georgia, and uh, in Birmingham, and Montgomery, and Huntsville, and, and, uh, and fucking Monroe, and Shreveport, Louisiana. Like, I had the number one record with You Ain't Hard, and motherfuckers in those cities and them states got a chance to hear I Apologize on the record as well, man. So, you know, um, that, was, that was how that record came about, man. Those were real experiences. You go back and listen to all those verses, those, that was me apologizing to three different people, three different women in those verses yeah. on, that, on that song, man. And that's just, it was actual real life events that happened Classic, in that song. Bro. You know what I'm talking about? So that's how that happened. Bro, you said it chill, boy, cause boy. When that, when that thing dropped, bro. <laughs> man, bro, you, hey, that's what. Yeah, man. So, you know, when it's organic, man, and, and it's from the heart, yeah, man. people gonna gravitate to it. You don't even really have to try too hard. And I didn't even really think it was gonna do what it did. And uh, it just did. So to this day, I'm still amazed because, you know, like I said, I traveled the whole state doing that song, man, looking out in front of hundreds of Hundreds of niggas in country towns, man. <laughs> that's all I want to hear. I apologize. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, that's what y'all, what y'all want to hear is what y'all gonna get, man. That's it. That's what's gonna happen. You know what I'm saying? That's hard, bro. Yeah, yeah. Hey, go ahead, bro. Hey, so I remember, man, I'm like 18, 19 years old. They got the show, Assets Granted. Mm -hmm. They got the video show. For, uh, bust your head to the white man. Mm -hmm. It seemed like the whole state of Mississippi was at the video. <laughs> Bro, speak on that day, man. And man, that day was crazy, brother. Um, so, record had already took off, 
And the funny part about it is I tell folks, because I wasn't going to put out You Ain't Hard first. Right. Uh, it's a song on Two Broke the Ball called Hustling. Uh, and I was going to put Hustling out because I felt like the hook on Hustling was a little bit stronger. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was divine intervention. I don't know. Something happened when I was yeah. on my way to the radio station to get Stan his record. By the time I got there, I said... This the one I want you to go with. And I handed him, you ain't hard. And I already had clean versions to the songs already, which by the way, everybody's just not that man. When you make your records, make clean versions for your records right off the bat. Right. Make them while you're in the studio. Oh. Don't go back and spend no extra time and no extra money going back to clean them up. Clean the motherfuckers up while you're in there at that time because somebody going to ask you for oh, them so you can have them, man. So I'm going to give you that little piece of game to prevent you from spending money and also so you can be prepared when niggas email you and ask you for your records. Right. I had clean records. Right. So I had clean records. I was always making clean records to all the records. And I went in and said, I don't stand and slid him that one. And uh, I walked out and I was like, uh, we're going to see what happens. And I put it in God's hands at that, first, at, at that point. And two weeks later, Stan called me and he said, Kamikaze, you got to hit. You got to hit. And Stan had never called me before. He didn't call me when I took him. I apologize. He didn't mm. call me on the phone. Mm. So he called me. He said, you got a hit. And uh, he was like, you got a bona fide hit. The phones is lighting up. So, you know, when I tell people all the time, when the phones is lighting up at the radio station, it's a good thing. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's that's numbers. That's data yeah. that motherfuckers can use. And they say, you know, you know, I'm hearing little kids walk around town saying it. I'm hearing old people saying it. I'm hearing it played in the morning. I'm hearing fight songs at, yeah. the, at the high schools. It's happening. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's the got band in in up level. DJ yeah. Lowe said we had the band the record over here. They had the band the record over, uh, you know what I'm saying, on the strip. Yeah. Like, he got banned at a whole bunch of places because, you know, it was just starting rise and shit. Hard, so, uh, that day was crazy because at that time I was already out kind of doing shows off the record. So, you know, we set up the video shoot, man. I paid these folks to come in from California to shoot this video. We had a trailer out there, you know, to sit up in, you know what I'm saying? We had it all set up. And at the time it was crazy because I used to stay in these apartments right off of Prentice on First Avenue. Okay. Uh, the Courtyard Square Apartments where you saw the video at, okay. as a matter of fact. So, you know, I was staying over there before I moved. I moved from over there. As a matter of fact, You Ain't Hard was the record that helped me to move out that motherfucker and move back out of North, know, as, right. a, as a matter of fact. So, but I told the people uh, when I left from over there, I was like, when I shoot this video, I'm going to come back over there and fuck with y'all. The shots out to all the people that was over there, man. Everybody that was over in the hood over there fuck with me. Uh, everybody that was over there was supportive, except for a couple of motherfuckers uh, right. who, who we won't name on that street, man. But, you know, there was a time in between, the Crooked Letters time and before You Ain't Hard happened, where, you know, life happened. You know right. what I'm saying? Kids was having all kinds of shit, so I didn't even really know if I was going to even really keep doing music right. to the point. So, you know, nigga was kind of just, life was on a nigga back. And this shit right here helped the motherfucking take it to another level. So, yeah. you know, we went back and shot the shit over there in the apartments on that day. Everybody on the block came to fuck with us that day. Everybody came out. All the other rappers came out. All of the, you know, the tastemakers, the players, pimps, hustlers, you know what I'm saying? Everybody came out. <laughs> and they was out there at that spot while we was uh fucking shooting, you know, early in that day. And then that night, we shot at the upper level. <clears throat> Everybody came out at that motherfucker, man, and it was packed like it was, so packed. It was packed like the upper level sure. would be packed on yeah. that motherfucker. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And we shot that video in that night, man. We had us a goddamn time. Yeah. <laughs> we had us a goddamn time in that, that night, man. It was fantastic. Uh, it was classic. It's gonna go down in history. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So when you go see the video, just understand, man. We had a good motherfucking time. Shouts out to Winston. The nigga Winston was, 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 was so hilarious so in the beginning, Winston. you know what I'm saying? So Winston came through, uh, Big Baby Alice Marie. We yeah. shot that, that beginning scene, man, actually in my actual bedroom that I grew up in in my crib, you know what I'm saying? Okay. So we went over to my house over at Northgate, and uh, Alice Marie was in my house, and Winston was in my house, and Winston was actually in my room. All that shit you see on the yeah, wall in there, yes, all yeah. that shit in there, that was my room that I motherfucking grew up in at yeah. the time, you know what I'm saying? And my brother was still there at the time. So all that shit, man, my folks had pretty much just left that shit just like it was yeah. up in there, man. So I was, yeah, he was in my actual room ironing. Uh, you know, he was ironing a jersey that we made. We had put on one of the jerseys yeah. that, that Banner had at yeah. the time. One of the six-on-one jerseys, yeah. man. And uh, man, shit, the 
rest is history, man. Like that was that was probably one of the greatest days for for Jack Town music ever in the in the history yes, of the city, sure. man. Everybody came out, everybody showed love, everybody showed support, man. Everybody supported that record because everybody felt like they was a part of it. Yeah, at right. the time they had already seen yeah, Banner exactly. doing this thing, so right. motherfuckers was really waiting for me to do my shit. So when that shit happened. It was like, you know, I right, it's this nigga's turn to do his thing, man. Everybody came out to show love for him, though. I, I, I don't mean to throw this out, but mm-hmm. I just want to crib a few rooms, bro. Mm-hmm. And I know I want the only person that felt like this. Mm-hmm. When David Banner got big, like, he at, at one point in time, David Banner got huge. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about huge. He Mississippi was, the album was the number one hip hop record in America when it came out. Mm-hmm. Number one album on the hip hop and the R and B charts. Yeah, number one. He was yeah. huge. Mm-hmm. So uh, a lot of people felt like Banner <laughs> did his thing and kind of left you behind. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you and Banner have any falling out in between that? No, nah, man. Me and Banner ain't never had no beef. I just explained to you what happened. It was legal shit. Yeah. That forced us to have to make a move mm-hmm. because when we couldn't record as crooked letters, wasn't no money coming in. I had kids. Banner would want to. Banner wanted to move around and he needed money because yeah. you know what I'm saying he was doing what he needed to do. So he mm-hmm. went to New York and he started selling beats, and the shit just happened how it happened. Happen, yeah. Uh, shit happens for a reason, dog. Nothing. Nothing is happenstance in this world. Yeah. You know what I'm saying yeah. nothing just you know have, happens randomly. It was in God's plan for him to go to New York. And go to Atlanta and do what happened, and it was his plan for him, for me to put that record together on my own and yeah. do that shit. And during this whole time, like a lot of people don't understand, me and him I always talked. We uh, always had conversations. Mm-hmm. Uh, he produced records on the Two Broke the Ball album. Yeah, right? he, uh, he was on records whenever I called a nigga and needed him to do something. He did it. Yeah. So I tell people all the time, dude. You know, I'm a grown ass man, and I'm accountable to myself. And to my brand, mm-hmm. David Banner was not responsible for Kamikaze and what Kamikaze was doing. I didn't get left behind. I was okay. here. I made that motherfucking record that I made. I made that album that I made, and it mm-hmm. did what it did. And the universe put me in the path that he intended for me to go. So mm-hmm. it was never no beef. You know, me and him just talked the other day. It's the 25th anniversary of Grey Skies coming up next year. Mm, right. So, you know, we having conversations about, you know what I'm saying, possibly commemorating that in some kind of way you know, next year. So yeah. we always talk. It ain't never been no beef. I think people created that because people like drama and they right. have yeah. beef. So right. I think people yeah. just kind of created that shit so they could have some shit to say because they don't understand. Like, you know, people are always blame Banner because he didn't put niggas on. Right. Niggas, you're supposed to put yourself on. Thank you for saying that. Jam, jam, jam hard enough and you can put yourself on. I didn't wait for him to put me on. I jammed. I made a jamming ass record and I put myself on. Salute. And I was able to motherfucking start my own independent label and I was able to keep my shit going from there on my own and support myself. I didn't need him to come back and grab me by my hand. I didn't need him to come knock me on, my, on, on the door. I didn't need him to do any of that shit. And he always got a bad rap because people felt like he was supposed to come back mm-hmm. and, you know, go to motherfuckers and grab him by the hand and pull him up yeah. and say, come on here and do this shit. So yeah. I didn't get left behind, man. He he did, you know, he went and he worked his ass off to get to where he got yeah. to. Right. So like that. And a lot of people don't understand, like even in that time, man, he was still trying to figure out how to get his foot in the industry. Yeah. Right. So he wasn't straight himself yeah. Yeah. at the time. Mm-hmm. So when you're not straight yourself, you don't have time to, you know, have another grown motherfucker, another set of grown motherfuckers around you trying to goddamn do they shit while you're trying to get your firm foot, you know what I'm saying, and getting yourself together. And I started understanding that when I put my own label together and started doing my shit, I understand that same dynamic. Yeah. Uh, with all the other st- the stuff that I've done since then, anything, whether it's that shit, whether it's Jackson Indie Music Week, you know, whatever, Hourglass, or any of the artists that yeah. I work with, like, it's very difficult to grab grown motherfuckers by the hand and drag them along For if sure. they don't have the work ethic or the talent to be able to do what it right. is that they want to do. So, even during that time, like I said, if you look, anytime I called a nigga and said, man, I need you to do X, Y, Z, that nigga did. It was done. And that's all that I ever needed. And I, right. whatever I asked him for specifically, he did it. Yeah. Uh, I'm on Mississippi the album. Mm-hmm. I'm on the certified album. We got soundtracks that we did together yeah. during that whole time. After it happened, we did right. shows together. 
that wasn't around here. We yeah. did shows together. We did shows in the fucking Czech Republic. We was across the motherfucking Damn. world. We was in the Czech Republic in Prague doing shows over there together. You know what I'm saying? He was headlining and I was coming on right before him. We in front of 30,000 people in Prague. You know what I'm saying? Performing in front of more motherfuckers and a lot of niggas is going to be in front of their entire career. <laughs> yeah. We performed in front of that many motherfuckers in one day, in yeah. one night uh, in Prague. So we did shit and, you know, we just did our shit, man. We weren't, wasn't worried about what niggas was talking about, really. Because right. niggas is going to talk regardless. You, know, regardless. you know what I'm saying? So even if we don't say shit, they're going to make up their own story anyway. So it really don't matter. You know what I'm okay. saying? We just kept our nose to the grindstone and kept doing what we was doing. And he's doing great with what he's doing. Right. And I'm doing great with what I'm doing. And that's cool. You know what I'm saying? My family eating. Everybody around me eating. Everybody that fucks with me eating. Yeah. Everybody that's fucking with him is eating. So it's cool. I ain't on crack. Right. You know what I'm saying? Uh, downtown on Skid Row. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Homeless. Mm -hmm. So as long as that ain't happening, man, you don't need to paint no narrative and feel sorry for Kamikaze because yeah. I'm straight. You know what I'm talking about? That's really all it is on that too. I respect you. For uh, saying that, you mm -hmm. just really cr cleared up a bunch of rules because Banner never spoke on the situation. And wasn't really nothing to speak on. Hey, hey, for real. For yeah, real. Wasn't really hey, nothing for to say. Sure. It wasn't really nothing for anybody to speak on, really, because the only people that knew what our conversations was was me and him. Yeah. Right? Wasn't nobody else on the phone with me and him, so it wasn't nothing else to talk about. And even if you talk to Twa or you talk to Grover or you talk to right. Finger, anybody around here, they tell you the same thing. Yeah. Was never. Was never a problem. That was some shit that niggas just created because niggas like creating bullshit. Yeah. That's what it is. Because, um, uh, I don't want to say a name, but a popular rapper, uh, called his name out. He kind of big. He went off to do big stuff, but it was after y'all. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. He, uh, he really put it out there first to make people feel like that, the city feel like that. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I mean, you know, I still get cats to this day, man, who come up and say, Man, you know, I always feel like you was rapping the hardest in crooked letters. True. And I feel like you was this and I feel like you should have did this and I feel like Battle should have did this and you know, niggas gonna feel like that. I can't begrudge a nigga on how you feel. Right. If that's how you feel, that's cool. Right. But when they talk to me and I tell them, All right, look, dude, I'm good. I appreciate you for the love yeah. and I appreciate you for supporting the records, but you know, if you supported my records, then that's what I needed you to do right. at the end of the day. When niggas start making up their perception of what they feel like success looks like or what they feel like a nigga getting put on looks like, uh, you know, you, you putting a nigga in a box. Right. You know, your perception of what success is or your perception of what a nigga being on is is what you think. Right. For me, is making sure that all them youngers that I got is eating and there's a roof over my head and I got something that I can create generational wealth with. And for me, at the end of the day, Rap was never going to be the shit that I was finna do for the rest of my life any motherfucking way. Right, okay. You know what I'm saying? So music for me was always a means to an end to do mm -hmm. some other shit. I didn't start out doing this shit because, you know, I just wanted to motherfucking just, you know, rabbity rap, rap, rap. Right. You know what I'm right. saying? Right. I started out because I wanted to figure out a way to be creative and then use their creativity to open up other doors. Mm -hmm. And that's what that shit did. That's mm -hmm. like I was telling you earlier about the management thing. Like, you mm -hmm. know. You got a lot of life to live, man. And I did the music shit, you know, as an artist. I did that shit at one phase in my life. Then what you gonna do on the next phase? Just mm -hmm. like Banner has done right. with his philanthropy. Sure. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I was never in this shit to be in this shit for a long time, rapping and being a superstar. You know what I'm saying? If that was God's will, that was cool. But, you know, I have found my calling and my passion and doing a whole lot of other things outside of that. But it's always fantastic when people come up to me and say that they enjoy the music right. and they love the music and you one of the hardest to come out of Mississippi mm -hmm. and I love the Grey Skies album or I love the Two Broke the Ball album. It's not a lot of people that can say that they was a part of two classic albums like that. Not around here. No, it right. ain't a lot. You no. know what I'm saying? There's not a lot of people that can say that they were signed to major labels. There's not a lot of people that can say they did songs with Pimp C uh, and Noriega. There's not a lot of right. people that can say they been to Prague and Ghana, Africa, and performed in front of tens of thousands of people, 30, 40, 50 thousand people. It's not a lot of people that can say that. You know what I'm saying? I got a resume that can say all that shit. You know, when you talk about Jackson, I tell me all the time, when you talk about Jackson, Mississippi, the city proper. Yeah. Only four motherfuckers out this city have ever gotten a major label deal. And that's Wildlife Society, that's Crooked Letters, that's David Banner, and that's Dear Silas. So out of them four, 
two of them shits I was a part of. Yeah. Crooked Letters and Dear Silence. Yeah. So when it come to doing major shit in the city of Jackson and niggas being on major labels, I've been a part of 50% of the shit that came out of the city. Right. So that record right there can't be beat by a whole lot of motherfuckers. So, you know, at the end of the day, when the story is written, I ain't got shit to prove to nobody at the end of the day because I done done it as a player and a motherfucking coach. Yeah. <laughs> and ain't a lot of motherfuckers that say they did. But sure. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Speak on um, Hourglass Entertainment and uh, some of the artists you had the chance to work with, man. Oh, uh, man. So, I mean, I pretty much work with everybody in town doing consulting and working with people, man, and putting shows together. What I wanted to do with Hourglass is provide a platform because one of the things that we had coming up that kind of slowed down for a minute, like when we came up, we had Donny Money putting his own money into the UG. Yeah. Right. We had Donnie Money putting his own money into Inez's. We had Stokes putting shows together. We had us coming together, putting our shit together at the time. Yeah. And that slowed down for a minute. So you got a lot of artists these days, man, that don't have a platform for them to be able to perform and be seen. Right. So that's why, you know, I've taken Hourglass and that's why, you know, I founded Jackson Indie Music Week. You know, that's why I founded a lot of the different independent shows that I did because I wanted to provide cats with a platform. You know, when you talk about Jackson and the Music Week or Third Coast Radio and all this shit, man, like for a lot of instances, this is a lot of cats' first time ever being on stage when they right. come and be a part of Jackson and the Music Week. Or it's a lot of time, this is their first time ever being on the radio or getting a radio interview, being right. on Third Coast Radio. Like, so I wanted to take my knowledge and I wanted to take it and I wanted to help to push the scene forward. So for me, it was always a plan to move forward. Like, you know, it's great that we can sit here and talk about gray skies. It's great that we can talk about crooked letters. It's great that we can talk about two broke the ball, but she had to the white meat. All that shit is fantastic. But for me, what have you done lately, nigga? Right. You know what I'm saying? For me, yeah. what are you doing right now? For me, mm -hmm. what you gonna be doing five years from now? Are we gonna be talking to you five years from now? Are you still gonna be talking about that shit you did 20 years ago? Or are you gonna be talking about some shit that's gonna be forward facing? So right. for me, it's good to have a conversation about shit that I did, right. but I'd much rather talk about the shit that I'm doing now and the shit that I'm going to be doing. That's what's driving me now. And what's driving me now is just creating this platform for Mississippi artists to be able to have a foundation to show their shit regularly. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, we're going into year number nine of Jackson Indie Music Week. You know what I'm saying? And we got a festival that we got motherfuckers that come from all over the country to come down here and be here in Jackson, Mississippi to be a part of this music festival. You know what I'm saying? You give us a few years and, you know, we're going to be fucking with South by Southwest. Yeah, a few for years, sure. You know what I'm saying? So I dream big, you know yeah. what I'm saying? And that's going to be the goal of it. So we got Third Coast Radio, the only radio show that you can hear in all 82 counties of Mississippi mm, uh, sure. on National Public Radio. You know, we got awards and all kind of accolades because, you know, there, you know, there's no other radio station in the city Thanks. that you get your shit played and get heard all over the state of Mississippi. Thanks, so you right. get heard on Third Coast Radio, they gonna hear you in Tupelo, they gonna hear you in motherfucking South Haven, they gonna hear you in Biloxi, they gonna hear you in Vicksburg, they gonna hear you in Meridian, all at the same mm -hmm. time. Five o'clock every Saturday, and that's what's gonna be happening. So, you know, we getting cats from all over the state of Mississippi sending us music. So we gonna create this turnpike, we gonna create this, this, this thoroughfare for motherfuckers to bring their music through here so we can take this Mississippi shit to the rest of the world. You know what I'm saying? And that's really what it's about, really, at the end of the day. Because, you know, when people say it's Mississippi had a run. No, we haven't had a run. Right. You know what I'm saying? When you talk about having a run, like, we've had all those people that we named as doing their shit all individually. Right. But we haven't had everybody's shit popping at one time. Right. Like a lot of people. So... We want to get this shit popping where it's five or six niggas popping at one time in Mississippi. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? And, and that's what's going to make the shit work. And that's, what, that's what's going to make people come here and kind of realize. Right. People know the history right. of Mississippi. Right. Right. They know Robert Johnson helped to create the blues. They know Jimmy Rogers created country music in mm -hmm. Meridian, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. uh, they know about gospel music. They know about the Mississippi Mass Choir. They know about jazz. They know about all those things that had their origins in Mississippi. Every music form every genre of music Speak that only. exists in this country Preach. was created in some shape or form in Mississippi. We Preach. are the birthplace of America's music. So it's about changing that narrative and letting the world know about the rest of that shit really at the end of that day, man. At the end of the day, and I want you know, just tell motherfuckers that you can 
you can do that shit from right here in Mississippi. You can make it from right here in Mississippi. Motherfuckers say all the time, man, oh, I got to leave. I got to go to Atlanta. I got to go to this place. I got to go to that place. That's cool if that's what you want to do. But, you know, I've proven, you know what I'm saying? Like I said, I don't say shit or try to do shit unless I have proven that I can do it on my own. Right. Uh, and I've shown motherfuckers over the years that you don't have to leave Mississippi to get a deal. Crooked Letters got a deal sitting right here in Jackson, Mississippi. Mm. That label came down here. We did a showcase at Tiffany's. Shots out mm. again to DJ Finesse, Chris Carr. They came down. We did a showcase right. at yeah. Tiffany's with a live band. Oh, and wow. fucking Warner Brothers signed us from that right there. Dear Silas, we had five motherfucking record labels that flew into Jackson to meet with that man after he was going viral. We didn't go nowhere. We were sitting our ass right here in Jackson, and they flew down here to Jackson for that man to get signed and doing what he was doing. We didn't have to go nowhere. So, you know, I have proven on yeah. several occasions that you don't have to leave Mississippi to get put on. All you got to do is just work hard and be jamming. Yeah. And if you jamming, niggas is going to find you. And we have proven that time and time again. You know, when they found Mellow T and them, Herb God and them flew down here, like he told you. You know right. what I'm saying? Mello, Mello said, no, I'm not coming up there. You got to come down here first. That's the same mm -hmm. shit we said. Mm -hmm. When, you know, Sir Cap, you know, saw Mississippi Mafia, all them folks, man, you know, all the people, man, Batman, everybody was doing that shit on Wood Street, all the niggas from back in that era, man, you know, motherfuckers was taking a notice to what the fuck we was doing. At the end of the day, we just didn't figure out until we had a few little hits and misses. We didn't figure yeah. out how to take that shit in. Make motherfuckers know what we was doing at the end of the day. But now, that's where it is, man. That's really where it is that's at the end of the day. Right. So for me, I want to remain, you know, a force, you know, and, and a beacon for younger artists to learn the business, for them to have a business together, for them to have a branding together, their marketing together, and go out and represent Mississippi in a way that it needs to be represented. And mm -hmm. uh, I just want to be able to pass that knowledge down, you know yeah. what I'm saying, to, to folks. And that's going to be my legacy at the end of the day. Uh, my legacy as an artist, I think, is solid. My legacy as a manager is solid. Like, everything that I do, yeah, I'm so. doing it for a second, and I'm going to do it to stamp, you know, stamp myself in the area, and then I'm going to move on. It's like I told you, like, you know, working with Silas, that was a temporary thing. You know what I'm saying? He I'm has enough He has good. enough knowledge now to where yeah. now he's going off and he's doing the shit himself. Now, him and his wife is running his whole enterprise now, you know yeah. what I'm saying? But we took him from a point where he was here right. and got him here. And mm -hmm. then you move on to the next thing. So, you know, again, like, yeah. you know, it's like, you know, uh, Jay-Z told Dame Dash, you know what I'm saying? Well, if you made me, go make another make me. Another one. <laughs> so, you know, I try to prove every time. I did the crooked letter shit, that was cool. All right, well, what you gonna do next, nigga? Well, you know, I did two broke the ball. Okay, well, what you gonna do next, nigga? I got dear Silas. What you gonna do next, nigga? We're gonna do this, take this Jackson and Music Week shit, and we're gonna turn it into South by Southwest, and we're gonna show the city how we're gonna bring a million dollars into this city from people coming into this motherfucker like they come into Austin, Texas every year for yeah. South by Southwest, you know what I'm saying? And then the oh. next move is gonna be the next move after that, and turn Third Coast Radio into the Breakfast Club, and then we're gonna keep moving. Then when I'm done over there, I'm gonna take that shit, and then I'm gonna move on, and I'm gonna do something else until I decide that you know, I'm ready to go sit down at that point. You know what I'm saying? Oh. So that's really what it is, man. It's really always making sure what the next thing is. What is the next yeah. thing going to be? Uh, yeah. You know, all the stuff that we talked about earlier, all the legends that y'all talking to, man, that's fantastic. Yeah. And, you know, reminiscing is great. Yeah. And it's cool, but, you know, again, nigga, what, what have you done lately? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> at, the, the at, the, at the end of the day, you know what I'm saying, you got to keep moving. You got to keep doing you know, new shit, man, because we're going to grow up with a generation of cats, man, who didn't listen to music like we did. And they didn't right. digest music like we did, and they don't have the same love and respect for music like we did. So some of us had to be here so that we can teach. Mm -hmm. So, because if you don't teach, it's just like when you don't teach black history. It's just like when you don't teach Mississippi history and people don't know. You got people that are growing up right now that don't understand the history of Mississippi. Mm -hmm. Right. And what black folks have done in this, this state. Right. The shit that we've had to deal with or the, the famous people that we've had in this state or the right. good shit that we've had going on. All they growing up hearing is the bad shit. Mm -hmm. All they growing up hearing is the negative shit. So, it's got to be somebody here that's going to stand on that wall and say, no, nah, little nigga, this is what has been happening. Right. This is how this shit has gone. Read this, Google this, talk to this person, talk to that person. So, you know, what y'all are doing is real important, too, in the grand scheme. Because sure. it's letting a lot of people know about folks who kind of paved the way. 
mm-hmm. what was happening, man. So, you know, y'all getting the accurate stories from the horse's mouth. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I want to highlight something. Mm-hmm. To uh, uh, the few people who don't know who Dear Silas is, mm-hmm. what's, what's his, what's his uh, famous song uh, right now? So Dear Silas had Gullah Gullah Island, went viral first. Uh, skirt, skirt. Yeah. Then went viral. Skirt, skirt. Yeah. Then went viral yeah. after that. Uh, now he got the I ain't stressing the day with everybody. The day. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> so you know, I mean, Jubal. you know, he 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 he's amazing, man. And uh, one of the yeah. reasons I started working with him from the beginning is because of how amazing that he is. And like I said, all he needed was just a little a push. push. That's all right. he needed. Bro. That's all he needed. He didn't need me to come in and take over what he was doing. He just needed a little push, and we put a plan together. And that got him signed yeah. to Sony, yeah. and that helped to take him here. And then he kept creating content, yeah. and now it's taking him to a whole nother level. Yeah. And now he's going to probably be one of the most successful independent artists out there. And the whole plan from the beginning was for him to be independent. Uh, Sony was a means to an end. We did the Sony thing and got introduced to a nationwide audience. Right. And now he's able to take that now and put that into practice on the independent side. He's able to go and do his thing. Like now, you know, I wish him... All the luck in the world because, like I said, it's, it's getting bigger and bigger for him. But, yeah. you know, the foundation was laid, so yeah. now he can go. So what I want to do is, like, you know, with him, I want to continue to do that, man. I want to take cats from one level, take them to another level, show them how to do their business. Yeah. And then let them go out, man, and let them go and make some money because there's a lot of money to be made in this industry. And you don't have to be famous to do the shit. Right. You ain't got to be famous like motherfuckers don't understand you ain't got to be famous. Oh, right. you know, do you want to be financially stable for the rest of your life or you want to be famous? Because it's two different yeah. things. You for know sure. what I'm saying? A lot of niggas get in this shit because they want to be famous. They want to fuck hoes and smoke weed and mm-hmm. be in the VIP. And that's cool if that's what you want to do. Mm-hmm. I can't help you right. in that regard. <laughs> right. But if that's what you want to do, that's cool. Right. But, uh, you know, if you want to learn how to monetize what you're doing and learn how to monetize your content and learn how to actually make your music, your job, Mm -hmm. to where you can go out and take care of your family doing this shit, man, and not worry about whether or not niggas know who you are or not. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because that's niggas' biggest problem. They want to be famous. Right. Uh, But it's the difference between being famous and being rich. So, you know, if you want to be financially stable and build generational wealth for yourself, you got to know how to really brand your product and monetize your content. And uh, those are the artists that I want to help, the artists that want to try and do that shit, that's willing to listen and do that shit. If you want to be famous... Mm -hmm. And smoking fuck hoes, that's cool. I party with you all day, and mm-hmm. we can smoke and talk all kinds of shit. But you know, what I'm saying I can't help you go to the next level because we don't want the same thing, and oh. the goals ain't the same. Hey, um, from your perspective right now, mm-hmm. it's a lot of cats out there rapping. Mm-hmm. Who do you think can be the next potential person to take Jackson and? Put them on another level. Oh, it's, it's, it's a lot of folks out there, man. Uh, Nico doing his thing. Uh, um, Boss B. I like Boss B. Nico doing his thing. Mm-hmm. Boss B. Backdoor Sam. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, doing his thing. Uh, Parkway Man, of course, Salute. definitely. Uh, you know, Meezy is going to be the next Salute. movie mode. You know what Salute. I'm saying? Around here. Shouts out to Meezy. Uh, you know, I'm working with Meezy on a lot of different things, on some film projects, uh, some documentary projects. Uh, you know, he was young and they came up, you know, watching mm-hmm. watching right. him do our thing. Right. And when he started working on what he was working on, he reached out to me and said, Oh gee, I need you to come, you know, help me on this project. And that's kinda how the shit worked. Yeah. So, you know, Parkway Man gonna be huge. Uh, you know what I'm saying? He's a superstar, most definitely. You just yeah. look at it. You know what I'm saying? He just give you superstar this off the bat when you look at it. So, the uh, salute part you know, So, yeah. Uh, you know, Dear Silas, of course. Uh, you know, who else is that? Polo. Shout out to Polo Baby. Polo Baby hey, doing his thing. Polo, man. Man. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Polo <laughs> Baby doing his thing. Uh, Polo Baby picked a lane, and he said, I'm going to stay in this lane, and I'm going to yeah. do my shit, and I ain't going to do what anybody else doing, and fuck what y'all talking about. And he mm-hmm. got on P Valley. Twice, yeah, doing that as a matter of fact, you know what I'm saying? And he is gigging and he getting shows Mm -hmm. and he doing this shit. So, regardless of what you're saying at the end of the day, the numbers making sense, so we do, you know what I'm saying? And the numbers don't lie. So, if niggas is fucking with him like that, shots out to him, you know, he kind of learning how to monetize and do what the hell it is that he's doing as well. Uh, vitamin C 
is really dope. It's a lot of people that's What's really the, dope out there. Name? Uh, the one who be doing the viral freestyles in his cop that used to cut. Uh, King name. Ali. Oh man. King Ali is Ooh. dope as fuck. Uh, he over in Atlanta doing his thing, so he's oh. gonna be huge as well. Uh, franchise. We got oh, Chisel. Yeah, for sure. He's yeah. dope. Uh, you know what I'm saying? He doing his shit too as well. Uh, you know it's 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 really a lot. Like I tell yeah. people all the time, this generation. A rappers in Jackson is probably the most talented yeah. generation of cats that has ever happened. For they sure. way more talented than my generation. Way more talented than the niggas that was coming Absolutely. up during the time. Because during my time, you know, you had some talented cats. And you had some cats that wasn't so talented. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? They didn't stick around too long. Mm -hmm. uh, but now this generation of cats is probably the most talented generation of cats this year. They have more resources at their disposal. Also than we ever had. So the chances and opportunities that they have are exponential. It's boundless in what they're going to be able to do really at the end of the day. Yeah. So um, it's, really good. it's a lot of people that I didn't name that could fit in there. And right now, it's really up in the air. Like, right. you know the, you know the people that's, that you hear and that you see all the time. Right. Shouts out to Squirrel World, what Squirrel World been doing over there, yeah. what they doing. Uh, mm -hmm. And they providing a platform, mm -hmm. uh, you know what I'm saying? I'm talking to him all the time. He's trying to figure out how to monetize his shit so he can mm -hmm. make the big money like the other motherfuckers are making. It's hey, just a square world. Yeah, holler at us, man. Yeah, you know what I'm talking <laughs> about? So, you know, sure. y'all collab on some shit for yeah. sure. Uh, but, you know, on any given day, yeah. it could be any one of those people I named. I or it, or it could be somebody else that I didn't name Ooh. that's going to fuck around and pop off and have that song happen and then mm. they're going to be gone. I feel and then, it too. Even then, it can't just be that one person. Like, right, right. Part of the problem in our generation, and I will admit that because of the healthy composition that existed, part of the problem in our generation is because we was on some Highlander shit. We was on some There Can Only Be One right. shit during our generation. So it was funny. Me and Ben's talk about this all the time, and even Boo, like, you know, Ben stayed on the same street with Banner, but niggas felt like if they was Queen Boys fans, they couldn't be Crooked Letters fans. And the niggas that was Crooked Letters fans felt like they couldn't be 601 players fans. You know right. what I'm saying? Yeah. All the niggas that's stayed on the same street. Yeah. And, you know, that's because <laughs> it wasn't a whole lot of motherfuckers. But, you know, you can be a fan of everybody. Yeah. And everybody can get on. Everybody can do their shit. Like, you know, I said, this generation, it, it could be anybody at any time, at any point, because everybody right now is is at the top of their game yeah. right now. So, you know, so, uh, yeah. I, I look, it can't just be one person. Like, when the one person pops through, it's got to be two or three people that come right behind him with their own shit to start right. popping so people can say, okay, this Mississippi shit is a thing. Mm -hmm. People look at... Mississippi as a state, they look at all these other spots as, as a city. When they right. talk about Houston, they talk about H-Town. They right. talk about Dallas. They talk about Atlanta. They talk about Memphis. They talk about Miami. They talk about Chicago. Straight when going. they talk about Jackson, they say Mississippi. Right. So they consider us to be a state mm -hmm. as opposed to being a city. So we got to figure out how to change that dynamic because mm -hmm. this niggas in the Delta that's doing they shit. Yeah. This niggas on the coast is doing they shit. Everybody around here is doing they shit. And niggas is doing their shit in Columbus and Starkville. They don't want you to say that they from Jackson. Right. Niggas from the coast don't want you to say that they from Jackson. So Jackson ain't the only motherfucking place in Mississippi. Fact. Right. So, you know, everybody got to figure out how to get their own style or their own little shit that they got to their city or their town so motherfuckers can make sure that uh, they on top of their shit. You know, shouts out to uh, Ant 200. Shouts Same. out to uh, Big Walk Dog. Yeah. Uh, shouts out to uh, uh, what's the nigga that just signed with uh, Gucci? Is it Zay? Uh, yeah, Lil Zay. Lil Zay. Lil Zay. Yeah, yeah, Lil Zay. Shouts Ooh. out, shouts out to that nigga as well. So you know, niggas is you know, mm -hmm. Mohead, Mohead yeah. Mike. Smash, salute to Mohead Mike. Yeah, uh, oh, Mohead man. Mike. Like I can sit here all day and you know, and we just sitting here just talking. Yeah. Niggas' names just gonna keep popping up just <laughs> like, like flawless that. Flawless, you know the rich kid. Flawless. Oh, you know, er everybody. Dev Mac. You know, a yeah, whole bunch man. of people, man, is out here doing their shit, man. Mm -hmm. And uh, it could be anybody. Like I said, this is the most talented generation of niggas that has been, so it could be anybody at any time. And that's the dope part about this shit is because, like, a nigga, like, you know, it can really, really happen now. Just make sure you have your business together, man. You and, you know, make sure you got your head on straight, man, and make sure you you thinking about long term. Think about what you're going to be doing 20 years from now. Think about right. what you're going to be doing 25 years from now when you're not doing music anymore. And that's how you approach this music on this front end. 
Think about what's going to happen. Think about all the people that you've seen, that you like, that you listen to right. 25 years from now, and they're trying to fight to get control of their music, mm-hmm. or they're trying to fight to get control of their masters, or they're trying to fight mm-hmm. to get royalties that they have owed to them. And these are all people that you used to listen to, that mm-hmm. you was like, oh, these niggas is famous, yes. and I don't want to be like these niggas. Yeah. And then 20 years afterward, you're trying to figure out, God damn it, how can I get paid? Or mm-hmm. niggas is using this, or I got to get property in my songs back. Like, ownership is important. Mm-hmm. You know, your writers, your 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 producing, you mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? All of that shit, man, is very important. Ownership is very game. important, man. Make sure that your game is together. And before you rap your first motherfucking rap, man, make sure that you got all your paperwork together. Make sure you got your shit registered. Make sure you got all your shit copyrighted. Make sure all your shit is together, man. Yeah. You're going to have to invest some money in what it is you're doing. Right. You know, a lot of times, you're going to have to invest money on the front end, not just on studio time and production, but you're going to have to invest time in and a lawyer yeah. right. and a business manager and somebody else is going to help you to get that together. And if you can't afford that, get somebody that really loves you, not somebody that's going to mm-hmm. be there because they're trying to ride your way. Right. right. But get a motherfucker there if it's a mama or an auntie or a cousin or somebody that loves you. To watch your back and watch your shit, man, and watch your watch your business, so that you don't goddamn it get taken fast and get robbed like we did and a lot of other motherfuckers did in the very beginning, and uh, you can skip a lot of them potholes that we had to goddamn go through. But if we didn't go through it, we wouldn't be able to tell y'all right. how this shit is right now. You know what I'm talking about? That's some real game right there. Yeah. I, I I I salute you, bro, for for cause that's some real game that you just gave them. Mm-hmm. And uh, my thing to them too, hey, Jackson artists stay out of jail. <laughs> Y'all stay out of jail. I mean, black men stay yeah, out of jail. Right. Period. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Not just rappers. Uh, you know what I'm saying? That complex, that that prison industrial complex, man, is making millions of dollars yeah, for folks man. out here, man. So stay on the straight and narrow, man, and uh, you know, stop. Stop wanting to be, you know, show niggas how gangster right. you are. Show yeah, niggas stop how, trying to you know, John Morant finna fuck up $200 yeah. million dollars doing that same shit. And trust and, and believe. There's a lot of y'all niggas over the years, even back from when we was doing it, because it was a lot of niggas from Woodley and Woodhaven and Lakeover yeah. that was rapping like they was dope boys, nigga. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and we know that you wasn't. And there's a lot of niggas doing that shit right now. Mm-hmm. It ain't cool to glorify some shit that you're not really a part of. Spend. That shit ain't gonna do shit but get you jammed up and fuck your whole life up. You right. know what I'm saying? Because once they put that tag on you, it's going to be on you for life. Unless you got a motherfucking good ass lawyer and some good people around you and get your shit expunged. And a lot of times that shit don't happen. Right. Once they put that felony tag on you and once you've been up in there, man, you know what I'm saying? It can be hard for you at the end of the day, man. So, uh, yeah, black men, period. Black women, everybody. Yeah. Stay out of jail. Stay out of prison. So. Uh, stay off the motherfucking streets because ain't shit there but but death or jail for yeah, you on that shit, so. man. If you're going to take this opportunity now with social media, with TikTok and all this shit now, if you're going to figure out a way to monetize what you're doing, yeah. this is the best know. time right now. and any to do it right now. Yes, if you're not a person that has any of those skills or you don't want to work a nine to five, you want to be an entrepreneur, if this is what you want to do, then this is the time frame for you to be able to do it in, my nigga. You know what I'm saying? So take that from me. Uh... And again, man, I appreciate y'all for, for having for me sure. on this platform, man. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Sure. Hope y'all got what y'all need. Yeah. Hey, one thing before we leave. Yeah. First of all, I want to uh, appreciate you, bro, for giving us the interview. Oh, good. I appreciate y'all for having me. I appreciate the jewels and the game that you dropped on us today. So, uh, you, you, you even, uh, you spoke well about Banner. And mm-hmm. you spoke, not just Banner, you spoke well about I ain't, got, I ain't got nothing bad to say yeah. about anybody at all whatsoever, man. My experiences has been good. Everybody. Like, uh, you know, uh, see, from Banner to Boo, the Reese and Bigelow, the Queen Boys, the Mississippi Mafia to Wood Street Players yeah. to uh, Renegade 601 Players. Uh, you know, er- everybody, you know what I'm saying? Shots out of Grave Digger, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. All, all, all my niggas that was around us around that time doing what we was doing, man, Tony B, DSP, uh, Jack D, everybody. I ain't got nothing but, but good shit to say. Asiatic black, I ain't got so nothing but good shit to say about anybody, man, because some of us ain't here no more. Uh, rest in peace, DJ Ham. Some of us ain't here no more. Rest in peace, Fat Daddy. Uh, you know, some of us ain't here no more. And right. we get to that age right now, man, with all of us, man, we getting to that age where some of us, you know, not going to be here. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? When you done live long enough, you going to start looking around. Some of the niggas that was with you ain't going to be there. But I, you know, boo, I got nothing but good shit to say, man. And in most instances, man, the shit that motherfuckers tried to make up between motherfuckers is the shit that they just created to make up shit. I ain't Mm -hmm. never seen nobody 
had no motherfucking beef with nobody, not right. from what I say. Right. You know what I'm saying? And in most instances, if I did, i try to ignore it anyway because I ain't on no bullshit. Right. I'm going to be on a positive track whichever way it go. But I ain't never seen any of the people I just named. I ain't never seen any of them motherfuckers have a cross goddamn conversation or debate with any other other motherfuckers that I just named. It's always been love. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And if anybody got anything else to say on it, I don't have no idea or no inkling of it. And it don't matter at this point. <laughs> hey, hey come here. before we get out of here, mm-hmm. give us one guess. Did you think, uh, OG from back in the day, man, that people probably slept on, man, that you think we should try to interview next, man? Oh, man, shit, y'all done. Y'all done interview Batman, y'all done interview. Have y'all interview Reason Bigelow yet? Well, they on the yeah. way. Right. They on the way. You definitely got to fuck with them because they got a brand new story to tell. Mm. Not just the old story, mm. but they got a brand new story to tell for some shit that they got going on right now from another viral situation that they got going on that they done made a lot of money off of recently. So you definitely got to talk to them. Uh, you know, definitely got to talk to uh, Queen Boys when you get a chance. For sure. Uh, you got to talk to, if y'all can talk to Freddie Young, definitely need to try to get Freddie Young. He's a recluse. Oh, you know what I'm saying? He be on the low. Yeah. You got to talk to him and you got to talk to Charlie Braxton, uh, the yeah. writer. You got to talk yeah. to Charlie Braxton. Yeah. Uh, as well, uh, you know, if you get a chance to definitely talk to DJ Finesse, Asiatic Black, Fingerprint, DJ Scrap. If you can get them four DJs together or even get two of them together and talk about this DJ shit and this promoting party shit and the shit, because them niggas was really kind of the catalyst of helping a whole lot of this shit outside of Donnie Money, what Donnie Money and Stokes and all niggas was doing, like giving the platform, like them niggas was throwing the parties and doing the shows and shit that was giving a lot of motherfuckers a platform. And a lot of them niggas was playing Jackson nigga shit right. before anybody else. Like, if it wasn't for Black and what he was doing in the Birdland back in the day, for sure. like, a lot of niggas wouldn't have got heard. Like, a whole yeah. bunch of street niggas wouldn't have got their shit played any place else if Black didn't make their shit hot. If you was getting spun in Birdland, my nigga, on Sunday night and Black was spinning your shit... <laughs> You was hot than a motherfucker. And I, was, and, I, and I was blessed to say that, you know, he was spending my shit in Birdland mm-hmm. on Sunday nights. And a lot of niggas there was, when you got in that rotation, that after midnight rotation at Birdland on Sunday, if Asiatic Black was playing your shit, nigga, you had made it at mm-hmm. that point. You know what I'm talking about? And that was one of the places where you had to motherfucking make that shit happen and had to pop with Asiatic Black. So definitely talk to him too. We got your chance. And, uh, uh, I know he said it let that, but I got one more thing, bro. Okay. Bro, this some this something new. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. Would you do one of your verses from your song, bro? Cause the world don't understand. one of the coldest. Yeah, man. Out of all eighty two counties, man. Man, y'all put me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Y'all, if y'all have told me ahead of time, man, I might have been able to do some shit. God damn, man. <laughs> hey, you got it, bro. Damn, man. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Mmm. 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 Let me see if I can do this one all the way through. All right. Now gather around, boys and girls, because this here is a new chapter. I'm introducing the Magnolia State's most prominent rapper. You wouldn't recognize a lyric if it walked up and slapped you, because on this mic, a few preceded me, but won't be none after. So I suggest you dudes retire so we can send you to pasture. You cross paths with this rapper, it's gonna be a show enough disaster. See these skills, they come from God. I sent the world through my pastor. I seen you shine by 20, 30 times. I watched from the rafters. Cause I ain't trying to outlast you, man. I'm trying to outwrap you. If you don't go hard, man, sometimes that I lash you. A little birdie said they cowards, man. They too scared to pass you. You get your time. Don't pay them no mind. I doubt this a passion. Cause most of this industry is full of these arrogant bastards. If you don't get down with they click or suck they dick, then they trash it. But I refuse to kiss your asses. I'm going to make it much faster. Y'all some toys, some Bruce Leroy's. Bow down to your master. Now, what's my name? Show sure enough. Say salute, salute to the OG, man. And I fucked it up a little bit, too, man. Y'all put me on the spot. <laughs> you got it, man. It's all good. Man, it's your boy. Man, man, so crazy TV and Juicy the Legends, man. We got the OG, man. Come a in the building, baby. Appreciate y'all, man. We out here, bro. Appreciate y'all. Peace.